imagine the Earth, and imagine that the uh, Earth's size could be varied, so we can study the limit in which the Earth's radius becomes infinite or very, very large. It is very large, but uh, very large compared to ordinary objects like houses, trees, and cats. Then there is a separation of scales. So let me just say exactly what I mean by that. One scale is the radius of the Earth, which I've called L Earth. Another degree, another um, uh, type of length scale is the length scale of houses, trees, and cats. And in this limit, it's the limit in which the radius of the Earth divided by the radius of a house becomes infinite. That's the, um, that's the analog of the semi-classical limit. At the same time, the radius of cats or the size of cats to the radius of houses remains finite. So there's a scale of houses and cats on the one hand where ratios remain finite. There's another set of finite quantities. The ratio, for example, of the area of triangles on the surface of the earth where the triangles are fixed by their angles The ratio of triangles to the size of the Earth, those also remain finite. I'm talking about big triangles now on the surface of the Earth. There are two different kinds of scales, what we can call the scale of cats and what we can call the scale of triangles. In a certain sense, they decouple from each other in the limit that the Earth becomes very big. As far as cats and houses go, we might as well think of the Earth as flat. As far as big triangles go, we cannot think of the Earth as flat. So if we wanted to probe the fact that the Earth is a sphere, we would want to be studying the big triangles and not the little cats. Okay, there's a similar notion of separation of scales. I'll do it for four-dimensional Gasita space. I'm used to doing it for three-dimensional, but let's do it for four-dimensional Gasita space. The horizontal purple line is the line of scales. It's a logarithmic line, and it can either be thought of in terms of length scales, which go from large length scales on the left to small length scales on the right, or in terms of masses, which are inverse to the length scales, which go from small masses on the left to large masses on the right. On the left, we have minimum mass scales. The minimum mass scale that you can put into the sitter, if you like, think about Euclidean the sitter, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the minimum mass scale that makes sense in the sitter corresponds to a wavelength which fills up the whole de sitter space. That corresponds also to a minimum mass scale, which happens to be the Hawking temperature, the ordinary Hawking temperature uh, of the sitter space. On the far right, is the maximum mass we can put into the sitter space. In four dimensions, it's roughly the mass of a black hole whose area is comparable to the area of the de Sitter space. In other words, whose entropy is comparable to the entropy of the de Sitter space. A Narii black hole would be an example. Uh, and that's the largest mass you can put into the de Sitter space. At the lowest energy scale and the largest energy scale, things are very definitely um, sensitive to the radius of the de Sitter space. And then right in the geometric mean between these, and it's interesting that it's the geometric mean is the Planck scale. The Planck scale happens to be the geometric mean between the, the Hawking temperature and the Narii uh, mass. It's M Planck. Right in the smack in the middle is the Planck mass. Now, when I speak of the Planck mass, I'm going to mean anything that scales together with the Planck mass. For example, there might be strings in our theory. If there are strings, it's normal to think of the string scale as scaling together with the Planck scale. I will do so. Uh, and so when I say Planck scale, I could mean string scale, in fact, I could mean a great many things which scale together with the Planck scale. We'll come to it in a minute. All right, the Planck scale is the geometric mean of the maximum and the minimum. And let me draw another picture of these scales. In the middle 
is a rather large region of scales for which we might as well think of space time as flat. Those are the scales which lie between, well between the cosmic scale and the Narayi scale. The cosmic scale, I mean the Hawking radiation scale. For those scales, that includes particles, strings, cats, houses, even galaxies. And I'll think of all of those as scaling together with, uh, with the Planck scale. And on the far ends, where we do have sensitivity to the, the sitter radius and so forth, we have what I'll call cosmic scales. That includes the wavelengths of Hawking radiation, the frequencies of quasi-normal modes. On the right-hand end, there are these Narii black holes. I won't be very interested in those. The two scales of interest here are the cosmic scales and the Planck or flat space scales. The separation of scales simply means that certain ratios go to infinity. For example, the ratio of the maximum scale to the Planck scale goes to infinity in the semi-classical limit as does the ratio of the Planck scale to the minimum scale. Those go to infinity, while certain ratios remain finite. The string scale to the Planck scale, that's some coupling constant. The string scale's coupling constant, that remains finite. The ratio of the size of a cat to the Planck scale remains finite. Also, the ratio of the Hawking, the, the um, the frequency of Hawking radiation to the frequency of, of uh, quasi-normal modes remains finite. These are two different scales, cats and quasi-normal modes. Two different scales which separate from each other, but each one has a variety of things which scale the same way. They more or less decouple from each other. For our purposes, the flat space region will not be so interesting. It doesn't probe the curvature of the sitter space. Quantum reference frames are real physical systems with energy, momentum, and charge. An object is localized by virtue of being entangled with the reference frame. They meaning quantum reference frames, are essential parts of a system. In classical general relativity without quantum mechanics, a reference frame can be arbitrarily light so that it doesn't gravitate and disturb the system. In quantum mechanics without gravity, the reference frame can be arbitrarily heavy so that it doesn't fluctuate. But in a world with both gravity and quantum mechanics, quantum reference frames will inevitably gravitate, fluctuate, and become entangled with the rest of the system. We cannot ignore them. So then, why haven't we had to worry about quantum reference frames up till now? For example, in ADS-CFT. And I think you all know the reason. The reason is because we can always think of ADS-CFT, the CFT, as living in a laboratory with observers in the laboratory who are not actually part of the system, but interact with the system through tapping on the boundary, but with their clocks, rulers, and so forth, being outside the system, therefore not being subject to the gravitational forces within uh, the bulk. So we can make them as heavy as we like without disturbing the bulk interior. So ADS, because of its boundary and because of the way that it's set up, we never have had to think about clocks, observers, rulers, and so forth as part of the system itself. We've been able to get away with that issue. Uh, but the sitter space is entirely different. In the sitter space, I assume that all observers, clocks, rulers and so forth are part of the Decida space. They're made up of the same things that objects in the Decida space are made up of, namely the holographic degrees of freedom, which I've drawn as little purple dots very close to the horizon. 
I think you know what this picture is. It's supposed to be a picture of a static patch of the sitter space with an observer at the center carrying their clocks and measuring rods and so forth. And in the sitter space, or any real cosmology, all of the observers are part of the system, and we don't get to think of them as outside the system, and therefore we do have to worry about clocks and rulers as actually being fundamentally part of the system we're studying, capable of becoming entangled with it, capable of interacting with it. That was one of the physical lessons uh, that was in the paper by um c l p and w okay i won't talk much anyway about uh about double scale limit of syk but the problems i will discuss became apparent when one asks how to confirm a holographic duality between a quantum system like the ssyk infinity and some version of the sitter space what can one calculate and how do we calculate it we will mainly be interested, almost exclusively, in the semi-classical limit of the sitter space. The semi-classical limit, I take to mean that the entropy of the sitter space, that's a dimensionless uh, thing which describes it, that the entropy of the sitter space goes to infinity. C, L, P, and W introduced the idea of a physical clock. They may not have been the first ones, I don't know, but they certainly um, made it very clear of a physical clock at the pole, at the center of the sitter space, which uh, keeps track of time. I'm going to assume the mass of the clock is of order the Planck mass. Now, but all that means, that doesn't mean it's that that doesn't mean it has a mass of 10 to the minus 5 grams. It means it scales. It's made out of the kind of stuff that scales with the Planck mass. It could be a one kilogram clock. It, uh, I just don't want it to be a clock made up out of cosmic scale, out of Hawking radiation. Okay, so we'll assume that clocks are made up out of ordinary stuff, not Hawking radiation, and that they have a degree of freedom. The degree of freedom I'll call tau. Tau is an ordinary degree of freedom, uh, and I'll call it the clock time. And what we will want to do is take the field phi and its correlation functions and replace them, we'll replace the arguments of those fields by the clock time, and thereby define something which I think is gauge invariant, namely the value of the field at a time when the clock time is equal to tau. Now, question, is all of this necessary or is it just a philosophical uh, nicety? The answer is, I think that it is essential for knowing what and how to compute in order to compare a holographic theory with semi-classical the sitter space. So I'm gonna show you why. But before I do that, let's just say what a clock is. A clock is simply a small subsystem. It's made out of the same degrees of freedom that anything else in the sitter space is made up out of. It's made up out of those little dots at the, uh, at the stretched horizon, the qubits. We'll assume that it can be made to be weakly interacting with the rest of the system, that it has its own dynamics, a Hamiltonian, now, this is a Hamiltonian for a small subsystem and a degree of freedom, tau of t, which evolves monotonically with t. Not just monotonically, but to a good approximation linearly with t. So whatever it is, if it doesn't evolve monotonically with, or if it doesn't evolve um, linearly with t, well, we can probably handle that. But for simplicity, I'll assume that, the, that tau of t, the dynamics of tau of t, allows it to evolve pretty close to linearly with T. And as I said, we'll assume the mass of the clock is of order, the mass of ordinary stuff, atoms, molecules, taps, and so forth. Now, an interesting question 
is how long can a clock survive in the sitter space? There are two views of a clock's longevity, how long it can survive. Two idealizations, if you like. One, which I'm attributing to Witten, but it might be uh, appropriate to uh, attribute it to the entire collaboration. Clocks can be taken to be eternal. They live forever. I will ask Edward right now, I think what you really mean is that the clock time is a good deal longer than the, um, than the Hubble time or any times that we are likely to be interested in in doing experiments. But you don't really mean that clocks live forever. Our galaxy is gonna, gonna continue to rotate uh, about its axis for the next trillion years, I think the next quadrillion years, probably the next quintillion years, I don't know how long, but it's gonna go on for a long, long time, long after the, uh, the Hubble time. So in this picture, the clock, if the clock is represented by this red line here, it reads off time tau, and it just lasts forever. It's always there. The blue line represents uh, the, um, the scaffolding time t conjugate to the Hamiltonian. And we may consider correlation functions at different times. We can think of them in terms of the scaffolding time, but better yet, we can think of them in terms of the clock time. And I think you refer to this as dressing, basically to replace T by tau. Making that replacement is um, dressing the fields. In this picture, the clock lasts forever. And, um, and I, I think it's for many practical purposes, it's, it's the right thing to do. My idealization is a different idealization. It's that the static patch itself is eternal and that the clock lifetime compared with it is infinitesimal, very, very small. How long can a static patch last? Well, I don't know, but I'm going to assume it's at least exponential in some entropy. And in a model like DSSYK infinity, it might even be infinite. So the static patch is eternal and let's assume that clock lifetimes are not eternal. Um, what's the longest I can think of that a clock can last? Well, a clock could be a black hole, in which case it would last for the evaporation time. Uh, it could be made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons. It might be limited by the proton decay time, 10 to the 32, 10 to the 33, 10 to the 34 years. Um, but those are very modest times compared with the time that I'm imagining that the Desitter space makes sense. Everything in a thermal situation eventually thermalizes, including the clocks. Black holes evaporate, protons decay, hydrogen can become two photons. And when that happens, the degrees of freedom of the clock fall back into the horizon. That's what evaporating means here, that the clock eventually falls back into the horizon. And if you run the equations of motion backward, you will find out that the clock falls into the horizon going backward. Another way of saying it is the existence of a clock is a fluctuation. The presence of a clock is a rare fluctuation, which happens from time to time, but with a tiny probability. The probability being e to the minus the mass of the clock times uh, the radius of the I think there's a two pi in this formula, but um, e to the minus ml, which for a uh, Planck mass clock in our universe at the time when our universe really does become the sitter, will be something like e to the minus 10 to the 60th, a very, very tiny probability. And so in this idealization, we see clocks as intermittent, intermittent short-lived objects, short-lived not compared with the de Sitter radius, but compared with the de Sitter lifetime, with large gaps, huge, huge gaps of time between them, 
almost all time is spent without a clock. Uh, to implement this, we might imagine defining a projection operator. I, I don't want to try to make uh, too uh, precise a notion of this now, but just uh, to get an idea. Pi is a projection operator onto states when, with an observer and a clock at r equals zero. The probability for an observer at a time t is simply the expectation value of pi. And that's characteristically e to the minus the mass of the clock times L. Uh, pi does not have to be a one-dimensional projection. It might be a projection onto all the things we're willing to call clocks, clocks and observers. In terms of pi, we can also describe the lifetime of a clock or an observer. For example, just take the two-point function of pi of zero times pi of t. That represents the probability that if there was a clock at time zero, that there will be a clock at time t. And that's some function which I expect will have some width called little delta. Again, it might be 10 to the 32, 10 to the 35, 10 to the 37th years, or even 10 to the 100th years. But it's not e to the 10 to the to the 60th years. So that's delta. The projection operator, when calculated, would contain the information about delta. And little delta over big delta, big delta is the time between such events. That's the probability to find a clock at any given time. And that suggests that delta, because trace pi is so tiny, that big delta is very, very, very long. The time between clocks is very long. Now, the semi-classical limit in this view only applies to correlations when there is a clock present. During the time that there is a clock present, and as I said, that can be long on any kind of terrestrial or even ordinary cosmic time scale, we can consider correlations between fields. Those are the correlations for which the semi-classical limit should make sense. For example, correlation functions between points when there are no clocks in this vast wasteland in which uh, clock time doesn't exist we don't know anything about those. Semi-classical physics, according to this view, tells us nothing about them. And correlations between points separated by these huge, vast time differences are likely to be extremely small and zero. So the actual thing that we want to calculate as physically interesting is correlation functions between points during which a clock exists. Once we say that, incidentally, once we say that, and we're only willing to talk about separations here, which are small by comparison with the lifetime of the clock, we're pretty much back in the same place where, uh, where the Witten view of things makes sense. Uh, physical correlation, here's the way I would describe physical correlations. Physical correlations aren't just the expectation values of the products of these fields, but they contain a pi a. They contain an instruction that there should be a clock. They contain a projection operator. In fact, um, you can put the projection operator on the left, you can put it on the right, or you can put it in both places. We can translate the time so that the projection is at time zero, and then physical, physical quantities would just be expectation values of a projection operator saying, yes, there is a clock times a bunch of fields. Okay, now time translation is supposed to be a gauge symmetry. We can describe all of this in terms of gauge fixing. Given enough time, there will surely be a clock. Even though the probability of a clock is very small, given enough time, there will be a clock and the gauge fixing is simply to say the zero of time of the abstract mathematical time conjugate to the boost Hamiltonian should line up with zero of time of a clock. That's a gauge fixing condition. And it's a gauge fixing condition that just says that pi of zero, 
the, um, the projection operator onto a clock reading zero is just psi. In other words, that um, we, fix the, we fix the gauge by saying there is a clock whose time is zero at what we're calling the mathematical t equals zero. Once we do that, and once we fix the gauge in that way, spesa, then we're back in ordinary quantum mechanics. We simply calculate correlation functions in such states. The only caveat is to make these t's not be large on the scale of the lifetime of the clock. Once we do that, I think it's exactly, we're, we're back exactly in the same kind of mathematics as, um, CLP and W, but I don't think it's quite right for reasons that I'll explain now. Are we actually saying that the presence of a clock, a one kilogram clock, or even a 10 to the minus five kilogram clock at the center of the, the sitter space can possibly influence the value of these correlation functions? On the one hand, it sounds ridiculous, but we'll see. Consider a correlation function phi of t1, phi of t2, which uh, can be identified with through this extrapolate dictionary with the value of bulk fields at these points. But as I said, by explicit calculation, quantum field theory in a fixed background, the imaginary part of this correlation function does not vanish. It was calculated for, um, uh, for a, a number of cases and it's this picture over here. The main point is not so much the glitch at the moment. It's just the fact that it's not zero. However, let's go to the holographic theory. The imaginary part of this correlation function is just given by I times the expectation value of the commutator of phi of T1 and phi of T2, which is equal to the trace of commutator of phi of t1 and phi of, phi of t2. And the commutator of any trace is always ident identically zero. That's the cyclicity of the trace operation. Phi one, phi two is the same as phi two, phi one in, in its trace. So we now have a problem. The semi-classical theory is giving us a non-zero answer the exact calculation in the framework that I described at the beginning is giving a zero. There's another route to the same conclusion, uh, which um, uh, Daniel and Aguri have suggested, uh, well, which will be the subject of these other papers here. It's time reversal or CPT. When I say time reversal or CPT, I'm not gonna distinguish them. CPT, time reversal, same thing as far as I'm concerned that it's a gauge symmetry. It is a symmetry, it is a global symmetry of the uh, holographic theory. And as such, the claim is that it's a gauge symmetry, a redundancy, if you like. Um, C of t, this, uh, the commutator function here, is odd under time reversal. Oh, this, uh, this capital T over here represents time reversal. I had originally written a lecture with a regular capital T, but then it got confused with temperature. So I used this, um, this fancy T here to represent time reversal. Okay, C of T, this commutator is odd under, so it cannot be an observable if CPT or, or T is a, um, is a gauge symmetry. The only way around that is to say that it's zero. If it's odd, it can only be a, it can only be a observable if it's identically zero. And so that's another way of getting to the argument that, um, that the expectation value of the commutator is zero on the one hand, and that the imaginary part of the correlation function is zero. So there appears to be a conflict between maximally mixed rho, or we can use T as a gauge symmetry and the semi-classical limit. That's the subject of the paper that I wrote called The Paradox and Its Resolution, 
illustrate principles of the Sitter holography. It's a very short paper and uh, somewhat incomplete. I'll try to complete some of it here. Okay, what are the conclusions of all of this? One conclusion could be that the holographic principle for the Sitter space is just wrong. Another conclusion is the holographic principle is correct, but the Boltzmann temperature, the temperature in the Boltzmann distribution is not infinite. Another possible limit is that the semi-classical uh, approximation is bad. Or that just the Sitter space is just plain impossible. I don't think any of those are right. I think the correct conclusion is that clocks cannot be ignored. So let's, uh, let's talk about clocks. In any theory which has time reversal invariance, or CPT for that matter, if a forward-going forward clock can exist, a forward-going clock means one whose clock time tracks T, the mathematical time, approximately, then a backward-going clock can also exist. The time reversal operation on a forward going clock is a backward going clock. If T exists, then backward going clocks have to exist. An example of a clock, a very simple example of a clock would be a heavy particle moving on a line, non-relativistic with a Hamiltonian P squared over 2M. Uh, let the coordinate of the particle of the object be called tau. Tau, of course, is the coordinate which represents the clock time. Commutator of tau with P is IH bar, usual quantum mechanics, and tau is the clock time. If we construct a wave packet, which is narrow, not too broad, wave packet in, um, let's say, in momentum space, and which is supported almost entirely for positive momentum, then that particle will move to the right and tau will increase with time. That's one kind of wave packet. But for every such wave packet, there's another wave packet for which P goes to minus P. It's actually just a complex conjugate wave function in which the clock moves in the opposite direction. So for every clock or every state of the clock, which is a forward moving clock, there's a state of the clock, which is a backward moving clock. So clocks can go forward and clocks can go backward. And in fact, in this picture where clocks are simply intermittent fluctuations, there is equal probability for forward going clocks and backward going clocks. And I wanted to add, ask Ed a question at this point, but I'll, I'll save it for the end. Um, we'll come, back to my, come back to my question. But what I said is, is, is certainly true. What is a forward going clock? A forward going clock is just one whose wave function is such that the tau by dt is positive. I'll set it equal to one, but um, it doesn't actually have to be one. It could be three, it could be five, it doesn't matter. Uh, and a backward going clock is a state of the clock for which the tau by dt is minus one. That's all the forward going clocks and backward going clocks mean. Forward going clocks and backward going clocks are fluctuations, they fall back into the horizon. Here's a forward going clock, and by T reversal, here's a backward going clock. Now, this dotted line over here is another system which is emitted into the static patch and which is the object of study by the clock and the observer. Here's the clock and the observer, and the clock and the observer are studying this system which is emitted and absorbed. Here it is being emitted and absorbed and studied by a backward going clock or by a forward going clock. That's the system. I'm gonna make a simple model now, just for fun. I'm gonna make a simple model. The thing which is emitted and absorbed is just a harmonic oscillator, a particle on a spring. It's not the clock. Keep in mind, this line is not the clock. It's the system being observed. And I'll assume that it has a Hamiltonian. 
uh, approximately has a, can approximately be separated from the rest of the system and it has an approximate Hamiltonian, which for the moment I'm going to identify with I d by d t, where t is the mathematical abstract time, not the clock time. Okay. I'm assuming that there is such a Hamiltonian and that it's just q squared plus p squared over two, q being uh, coordinate. Again, q is not the clock time, it's just the oscillator time. It's easy to calculate for a harmonic oscillator what the imaginary part of the correlator of q of zero and q of t is. It's just sine t, it's sine omega t, but I said omega equal to one. It's just sine t, that's what it is. Now, for a forward going clock, we want to, we want to dress these operators now. For a forward going clock, tau is approximately equal to t. So that means for a forward going clock, the imaginary part of q of zero and q of tau is sine of tau. I just replaced t by ta tau. On the other hand, for a backward going clock, tau is minus t. And so the imaginary part of q of zero and q of t is minus sine of t for a backward going clock. Now this is not what we want. If t is truly a gauge redundancy, then it would be important that the imaginary part of this correlation function, the sign of it and the properties of it are independent of whether it's a backward going clock or a forward going clock. Backward going clocks and forward going clocks should have exactly the same properties if it's just a gauge uh, redundancy. The sign of Q of zero and Q of T should be the same for forward going clocks and backward going clocks. So I failed, but nevertheless, let's try to achieve what I want. Define an operator that's an operator that lives in the Hilbert space of a clock. Let's call it epsilon. Epsilon equals plus one for forward going clocks and epsilon equals minus one for backward going clocks. It's an operator made of the clock degrees of freedom and it's easy to check that it's odd on the time reversal. Here's the proof right here. Don't worry about it. It is odd on the time reversal. And let's take the clock of the system, sorry, the Hamiltonian of the system, not to be p squared plus q squared over two, but epsilon times p squared plus q squared over two. Now this is a little bit crazy. What it's saying is the Hamiltonian of the system depends on the clock the, and the clock, whether it's forward going or backward going. By Hamiltonian, I mean d by d tau, i d by d tau. It's a possible operator. Uh, let's try that out as a hypothesis. Then we would find that q of zero and q of t, t is not sine i sine t, but as i epsilon times sine t. Notice that in this case, the trace of this commutator is zero by virtue of the fact that the trace of epsilon is equal to zero. Epsilon has two eigenvalues, plus one and minus one. And so the trace of q of zero and q of t would be as required, would be equal to zero. But now when we dress the operator, replace t by tau, we find that q of zero, q of t commutator is i sine of tau, the same for forward going clocks and backward going clocks. That's exactly what we want, but it's a little bit crazy. It's a little bit crazy because it's saying that the clock which may be sitting at r equals zero and the harmonic oscillator, which may be far from r equals zero, are interacting. They're interacting in that the Hamiltonian of the system here depends on the clock variable epsilon. But I think that's the way it has to be. I don't think there's any way out of that. I think that's one of the things that, uh, that I've learned from this exercise, that the clock must inter interact with systems that it's measuring in a highly non-trivial way 
in a holographic theory. Okay, so if I'm right, then the Hamilton, then the uh, then the clock must interact in a highly non-trivial way with a holographic theory. No factorization of a holographic theory. Well, factorization just means things are um, are uh, not interacting. Let's come back to gauge fixing for a moment. I said earlier that uh, that gauge fixing is just pi equals one. Now pi, the existence of a clock is the sum of two projection operators, projection operator for forward going and backward going clocks. I don't think pi equals one is good enough. I think in order to reproduce the, um, the, uh, the semi-classical limit, the right gauge fixing condition is that pi of a forward going clock, or you could use a backward going clock too, but that you should choose a forward going clock. Now I have no doubt that when uh, Edward and his colleagues were thinking about this, the clocks that they imagined were forward going clocks. So I don't think they made a mistake by not, uh, by not saying the clock is forward going. I think they just assumed it was a forward going clock. But here we see that it really is important that you get the wrong answers. Uh, you, you wind up averaging over forward going and backward going clocks. And that is what sets the imaginary part to zero. Is there anything that we can compute which does not require thinking about clocks and which can be used to convert, convert? Now, the reason I would like to get away from clocks because because the building of a clock and a holographic theory, I have, who know, who the hell knows how to build clocks and um, uh, we would rather avoid the issue of actually constructing a clock in the system. Is there anything that we can calculate um, at least approximately, which doesn't require us to build a clock. As far as I can tell, the real part of correlation functions like phi of t1 and phi of t2, as far as I can tell, does not require a clock. The real part of correlation functions um, might be something that can be directly computed with bulk calculations in the semi-classical theory. Here's what they look like, the real part of correlation functions. They have this little glitch in them. In fact, if you plot the logarithm of the correlation function, that's always a good thing to calculate the plot. The logarithm of the correlation function, it almost exactly looks like a, um, like a uh, exponentially falling curve, the kind of thing you might expect for a, um, for a low mass particle in uh, in the sitter space, very low mass particle, just exponentially to the minus mu t in mu or something. It has this little glitch here. The little glitch is a feature, but it's a very minor feature when plotted globally like this. It does come from this scattering off r equals zero, but now perhaps we should say that it comes from scattering off the clock. I'm not sure of that, but uh, and in that sense, if we were willing to ignore the clock, maybe that's just ignoring this little glitch here. I don't know, but I'm thinking that that might be true. In any case, if anything is clock sensitive, whether it's a Rolex clock or a Timex clock, it would be the fine structure in this glitch here, which would be sensitive or which uh, the correlation function might be sensitive to because the glitch is actually just the scattering off r equals zero, which is where there either is or isn't the clock, forward going, backward going. The imaginary part is extremely sensitive. The real part might be sensitive, but only hopefully in this glitch here. And then the real part of the correlation function might be something that's computable and, uh, and able to be compared with the holographic theory on one side, and on the other side, the um, uh, the bulk theory. Okay, I, I I'm essentially finished. I had, there were more remarks I could make here. On how do you build a clock? Not easily. Some various clocks that you could think of. But to summarize. Clocks and quantum reference frames in general are not merely philosophical niceties. 
They're essential for knowing what and how to calculate and consider holography. Now, I did want to ask Edward a question. Uh, Edward, you communicated to me something yes. which I liked very much, but I can't confirm it. You argued that clocks, eter eternal clocks, yes. eternal clocks with energy bounded from below are asymptotically T invariant. And I think what you meant by that is that if a clock runs long enough, it will make a transition from a forward going clock to a backward going clock and so forth. Is that a true statement? Uh, essentially, yes. Well, what I meant was that if you have a clock with energy bounded below, yeah. you can't define an operator which is equal to T. Yeah. You can define an operator that's equal to the absolute value of T. Yeah. So it first runs down and then it runs back up. So you could take the opera. So in our paper, the Hamiltonian is mm -hmm. Q. But Q was bounded below, let's say, by zero. The precise lower bound yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. Now, naively, the canonical conjugate, which is supposed to be the time, would be P equals minus ID by DQ. Yeah. But that can't be defined on the half line as a self adjoint operator. No, I understand. What can be defined as a self adjoint operator is P squared. For no. example, the Dirichlet or no. Neumann boundary conditions. Yeah. giving two different operators. Right. And you can also take the positive square root of P squared, which I could call absolute mm -hmm. P. So there's an operator that corresponds to the absolute value of the time, but there's no operator that corresponds to the time. Okay, we could take we could take P squared over 2M, but uh, you know require the support of the wave function to be in some narrow range of P over which p squared uh, looks linear. So, sorry, sorry. So p is kind of, trying to be p is trying yeah. to be the time here. Yeah. So we call yeah. the Hamiltonian Q. You, it's backwards from. Yeah, here. I know, I know. Since I realize. Since we call the Hamiltonian Q, the time should be p. Exactly. But yeah, there's no. But still, p. but there is an operator absolute value of p. I know, but that's a very formal statement. It is. Yeah. It seems to me, it seems to me that a particle, for example, moving on a circle with a uh, with a wave function which is supported for positive momentum will stay supported for positive momentum forever. And um, therefore the average of, is it Q dot or P dot? Uh, uh, the average of the velocity will remain positive forever. But what is the operator that you want to call time for a particle moving in a circle? Well, no, the I, no I, I, don't th I don't think so. Uh, Since you I, have think a I think this heavy particle moving on a circle uh, with a uh, wave function supported by positive values of the momentum or the angular momentum will, con in any physically sensible meaning, will continue to move forward in time for all time. Yeah, but I don't, think, I, I don't think there's going to come a time when you're going to see it moving backward. But what variable do you call time? If you want to use that as a clock, what do you regard as the time coordinate? Just the coordinate. But isn't there a more basic problem since it's yeah a it'll spread out but it will continue to move forward I, i'm not i don't know why you're not concerned that it only tells time modular one or modular one hour or whatever because the coordinate on the circle is a periodic variable i see i see okay yes um the first paper i ever wrote was about uh time variables for harmonic oscillators and uh, phase variables for rotors of this type 1963, I think. So yes, I, I, let me not disagree. I, I, I agree. The reason I like this idea is because then even in the context of the eternal clock, one will also have uh, have to worry about whether there are positive going clocks and negative going clocks. Uh, and if you wait long enough, uh, you'll see on the average. But I, I, I'm not sure it's yeah. true. Well, in our, uh, I do want to stress that, that in our approach, it's oversimplified to say that the observable is phi of tau. Well, you, it would be phi of the absolute value of tau more nearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or phi of the absolute value of tau plus a constant mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. makes sense. I understand. Okay, I think my question is answered. Um, I did have one other question. This does have to do with von Neumann algebras. Um, uh, is there time to ask the question? Sure. Go okay. Ahead.
right. Um, as I said, there's the separation of scales phenomena. And there are at least two kinds of scales which are interesting from the point of view of observations in the sitter space. There's the cosmic scales, and there's the micro Planck scale, or just we can call it terrestrial scale of, uh, of physics. Uh, let's concentrate for the moment on, on cosmic scales. Um, you, the, the, there's this issue of whether the, uh, the, the von Neumann type is type two, one, whatever that means. I think I know what it means. I think what it means is you start, um, you start with a, a, a state. It could be a state which is, contains a clock, let's say it contains a clock, and uh, you apply finite numbers of the basic operators to it, and you construct a Hilbert space which is made from finite numbers. It could be finite numbers of operators for example, on the, on the t equals infinity state, except maybe the t equals infinity state projected onto the existence of a clock. Okay, that, that's a finite number of basic simple operators that yeah. spans the Hilbert space. And the algebra of operators in that Hilbert space is, if I'm not mistaken, what you would call type two one? Yes. Okay. Operators now, where, where does that leave us with respect to the Planck scale objects? The Planck scale objects, if you ask how many fundamental degrees of freedom does it take to make a Planck scale object, you can work it out. You can just say, supposing you have a Planck scale object and there's an entropy deficit, the entropy deficit is of order the square root of the entropy of the consider entropy. It's of order square root of N. That's the entropy deficit for a, uh, for a simple Planckian fluctuation um much bigger than you might expect but it is of order square root of n it's just the Planck mass divided by the Hawking temperature that's the entropy deficit and if you work it out it's the square root of n or the square root of s it's very large and in fact goes to infinity as n goes to infinity and somehow I think that means that a Planck scale object is an assemblage of fundamental objects whose multiplicity is not finite, but of order square root of n. Does that mean that a single Planck scale object takes us out of the 2-1 Hilbert space? Uh, does the full algebra of the Sitter space, including both the cosmic scale objects and the, um, the Planckian or terrestrial scale objects, I think requires operators of size one for cosmic things and size square root of n for, um, um, and that seems to me to require us to expand the idea um, to include objects of size square root of n. That's the question I wanted to ask. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that's not a criticism of anything. It, I mean, it's an opportunity for, if it's true, then it's an opportunity for, uh, for expanding uh, the, uh, the ideas. Okay, that, uh, that's all I had to say. So thank you very much.